This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello, everyone. Trinitarians like to claim that the God of Israel had all along been this three-person being, and this wasn't revealed until New Testament times. There's a very big problem with that, because it makes God out to be a bit of a misleading trickster. And the reason for that is, is because Trinitarians like to claim that God just didn't tell anybody, or he didn't suggest that he was only one person or three or anything like that in the Old Testament. And... So this was just unknown. There was no information to tell either way. And when the New Testament times came, God suddenly springs it on everybody that he's actually three persons. However, that's not the truth. God did many things to indicate he was one person in the Old Testament. He refers to himself as I and me. His prophets refer to God as he and him. He portrays himself anthropomorphically like a single man with a head and eyes, a nose, a back. That's a single person, right? He portrays himself as an old ancient of days. An old father figure sitting on a throne in heaven. Now, even though we're just humans, we can see clearly that if we were portraying ourselves that way, we know that we would be misleading other people if, in fact, we were three persons. So God knowingly misled his people Israel into believing he was just one person by doing all these things and several others that I haven't mentioned. And when the New Testament times comes, God's like, gotcha. I was three persons all along. Tricked you. You see how God misleads and deceives in Trinity world. It's very troublesome. Trinitarians read their Old Testament through Trinitarian eyes, kind of like a Gnostic. In fact, they read the whole Bible like this. Their God is not mentioned in the Bible, so they have to imagine their God into the Bible. God is the main character of the Bible. He's mentioned thousands of times. Thousands. Yet this three-person God can't be found to be saying anything or doing anything. And so Trinitarians just sort of imagine that into the text by an act of their own will. They treat the Bible like Gnostics, the ancient Gnostics, um, how they treated the Bible. They always thought, you know, there's some secret in there. There's some secret code in there. 
And so they think, you know, this three-person God isn't being forthcoming. Who isn't forthcoming and transparent but liars, right? But because their God is a deceiver, trickster God, fashioned after their own image, they think their God, their three-person God, is kind of elusive and hiding among the pages of Scripture. And they're going to discover the big secret that he was there all along. It's a pretty sick way to approach the Bible, but that's what they do. And so when you come to the Old Testament scriptures, there are, you know, there's a number of passages where, you know, God says, I created all alone. I am God and there's nobody but me. I'm God. I'm, I'm it. The one speaking to you, I'm it. There's nobody else. And they think they get to imagine that's whoever they like. So if they need to have that be the triune God speaking, they just go ahead by an act of their own will and imagine their man-made God into the text. You see, they kind of have it in their heads that they can get away with that. And that the Bible never ever really says specifically who said those things. But here's the thing. It does. It tells you that it was the Father. Not in just some generalized way in the New Testament where it might say the Father was the God of the prophets. No, it'll tell you specifically that the one who spoke in those passages was God the Father. Specifically. And they treat the whole thing like this, this, th these facts aren't in the scripture. And they can get away with claiming this was the triune God speaking. Or this was God the Son speaking here, God the Father over there, it was the triune God in this other passage. And they can just by the act of their own will claim whatever they like. Eisegesis 101. Imagine your God into the text. Do whatever you feel like doing. Christians don't behave that way. They do the will of the Father. They don't do whatever they feel like. So they suppose, and they'll suggest it like this to you, that you really can't prove who was speaking in those passages. The scriptural facts aren't there. But they are. The scriptural facts don't show you that a triune God was the God of the Old Testament all along, and this is revealed in the New Testament. No. The New Testament actually reveals it was God the Father all along. The scriptural facts are there. They are there. And Trinitarians don't look for them because they don't want to find them. They only want to confirm their triune God. That's what the Trinity is. It's just a big, massive confirmation bias routine. That's why they've got shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves of books in the library to try and confirm their man-made God. It's never going to work. But they believe their own lies. So let's just look at one of these examples. And there are many of these examples. We're just going to look at one today. Exodus 20. This is where God is giving the law to the people of Israel. And he speaks to them out of the fire on the mountain. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who bought brought you out of the land of Egypt. The speaker is the one who delivered them out of Egypt. Out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven, above or on the earth beneath. Or in the water under the earth, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
Trinitarians. You don't get to make up your own God. And then when he finishes speaking all the commandments to Israel, this is what it says down in verse 18, and this is important. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we will die. This terrified them. It terrified them that they heard the voice of God, and they were afraid they would die, because they heard directly from God. And so they're asking, we don't want to hear directly from God. Yes, let God speak to us through a prophet like you, Moses, but we don't want to hear directly from God. It terrifies us. Very important thing to remember. And this happened on the mountain when God spoke to them out of the fire. So we're going to discover that the speaker here is God the Father. And the Bible specifically tells us it was God the Father. The facts are there. So I want to read a couple of passages from Deuteronomy for you that will sort of entrench this whole idea that Israel heard God speaking to them out of the fire on the mountain, and it terrified them. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire of the cloud in the thick gloom with a great voice. And he added no more. He wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. You said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives. Now then, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord, our God, any longer, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God says, then speak to us that all that the Lord our God speaks to you, and we will hear it and do it. You see, they're asking again. We don't want to hear directly from God. It scares us. You just tell us what God said, Moses. That's what they're saying here. The Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. So God says, okay, I understand, I hear you. Deuteronomy 5, to 28. Now here's another. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant when he commanded you to do the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone, Deuteronomy 4, 11 to 13. Moses speaking, Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard it and survived? Or has a God tried to go, tried to, go to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm and by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, He is God, there is no other besides Him. We're going to come back to that one. 
Out of the heavens he let you hear his voice to discipline you, and on earth he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words from the midst of the fire. Deuteronomy 4, 33-36. Who is Moses talking about? The Bible tells us. So who specifically is the speaker? Who spoke out of the fire? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Who is this me? Who is this I? The Bible tells us it's God, the Father, Jesus Christ's God. The God of Israel, the God of the Israelite Jesus. So now, we're going to discover that the New Testament does not reveal that the God of Israel was a three-person God all along, but the New Testament reveals it was the Father alone all along. Acts 3.22-26 Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet. Peter's talking about Jesus. A prophet like me from your brethren, to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you, and it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So Peter is quoting Moses. Moses said, And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. So Moses announced them. Prophets after Moses announced them. And then he says, It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, namely the Jews of Israel, for you first, first to the Jew, then to the Greek, God raised up his servant son and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Acts 3.22-26 that word there that I have translated as servant son, if you compare some translations, you might say, see it say servant in some verses, in some translations, or son in others. And that's because this Greek word means that. It's, it's a word for which we have no English equivalent. It's not the same word as Paul would use when he says he's a servant of Jesus. That word just means you're a servant, like a servant or a slave. This word means you're a child servant. And there's a Hebrew equivalent of this word and a Greek, but there's no English equivalent for this word. It's the Greek word pice. And if you want to hear about that, I believe James White has a video, and he'll tell you. If you don't want to believe me, or you can just look it up yourself. So, we can see that this prophet that was raised up was Jesus. So, who is God in this passage, and it's kind of pitiful that we even have to address this, but when you're speaking to Trinitarians, unfortunately, you do. It should be obvious that God here is the Father in this passage. And there's reasons we can know it was God the Father. Because it tells us that God sent Jesus. Well, we know who did that. It's all over the New Testament. The Father sent Jesus. That's the first way we know Peter is talking about God the Father. 
The second way we know is because God raised up his servant son. As I said before, this refers to your child. Your child is kind of like a servant in ancient thought, in Hebrew and in Greek. And you can also find that in the book of Isaiah. You'll find the Hebrew equivalent word where it's talking about Israel as God's servant. Well, it's the same word. It means like a servant's son. Israel was God's firstborn son, Exodus 4.22-23. You can see that also at Hosea 11.1. 1. There are several other passages which allude to the same thing. So Israel was like a servant's son. And it's usually translated as servant in the Old Testament. But it could say son. It actually means like a servant child. It doesn't necessarily need to be specifically a son. It could be a daughter. But for our intents and purposes here, we can just say servant son. So it's obviously God the Father here. Obviously. And there are more things in the context here which tell you that I'm not showing that proves that this is God the Father. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet. The Father raised up the prophet Jesus. And Moses says, like me from your brethren, to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So now we know with absolute certainty that the Lord God in this passage is God the Father. I mean, there's no doubt about that if you read the context. We can find Moses referring to God the Father's promise to raise up this prophet, Jesus, at Deuteronomy 18, 15-18. In other words, what Peter is quoting here, we find at Deuteronomy 18, 15-18. And this is where we're going to find where God promises that he will indeed raise up this prophet. So let's have a look at that. Moses is speaking. And he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among your kinsmen or countrymen or brothers. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Oreb on the day of the assembly. This is when the law was given, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire any more, or I will die. We read about that, didn't we? And God is now referring to that. The Lord said to me, They have spoken well. Hmm. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So there it is. There's the passage Peter was talking about. And we know from Peter, it was God the Father who made this promise. There's another piece of information here that tells us it was God the Father. Notice it says, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. This is what they asked Moses as soon as they heard God give them the commandments and it terrified them. Also notice, I will put my words in his mouth. When we come to the New Testament, and especially you'll find this in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us over and over and over and over and over, My words are not my own, but his who sent me. My teaching is not my own, but the Father's. He tells us this over and over and over. We know this is the Father, because Jesus later tells us, that the words that were put in his mouth are the Father's. 
So again, we're being told that this is God the Father by the New Testament facts. The, two, the New Testament is revealing to us that God here is the Father. Notice also what the people of Israel had asked. We don't want to hear directly from God. It terrifies us. We don't want to hear the voice of God. We don't want to hear directly from God. God says, I'll raise up a prophet. That prophet was Jesus. You see, when people heard Jesus, they were not hearing directly from God. That's what this passage is telling you. The whole point of raising up this prophet, which Peter tells us turns out to be Jesus, is so that people wouldn't need to hear directly from God. Give us a prophet and speak to us through a prophet. And God says, okay, I'll raise one up. Peter tells us it was Jesus. This proves Jesus is not God. But I digress. That's not what we're talking about in this video. What we're talking about is that the New Testament proves that the God of Israel was the Father alone. And it was the Father alone who spoke to Israel out of the fire on the mountain. Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. We know this is about God the Father now, don't we? It's indisputable. This passage tells us bluntly that first century Israelites, when they heard the voice of Jesus, were not hearing directly from the God of Israel. This was the point of God raising up the prophet. They were asking God, we don't hear directly from you. Speak to us through a prophet so we don't have to hear directly from you. This proves that they're hear not hearing from God when they heard from Jesus in the New Testament. Not directly, but through a prophet. And that's what Jesus tells us. My words are not my own, but the Father's who sent me. God promised to do this because they were terrified to hear the voice of God lest they die. Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore or I will die. We know that Moses is talking about God the Father, and God the Father is making this promise to raise up this prophet. All the facts tell us this. God the Father. So Peter showed us plainly that Moses was referring to God the Father who raised up the prophet Jesus and sent him, Jesus his servant son, to the people of Israel. We know with 100% certainty this passage, in this passage, Moses is talking about God the Father and what God the Father said concerning the Israelite request to not directly hear the Father's voice, again for fear that it would kill them, so God will raise up a prophet so they don't need to hear from God directly. It proves Jesus is not God. It proves God is the Father. Now, we're going to find out that the New Testament has revealed to us that nobody else is God but God the Father. Let me not see this great fire anymore or I will die. This terrified the Israelites. The Father spoke out of the fire on the mountain. The New Testament showed us this. The facts proved this to us. This was God the Father who spoke these words. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Me. 
Exodus 20. And there's more. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 4, 33-39. Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire? Well, we know that's God the Father now, don't we? As you heard it and survived, or has a God tried to go to take for himself a nation from within another Asian nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, as Yahweh your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, the one who spoke out of the fire, he is God, there is no other besides Him. We know Moses is talking about God the Father, because the scriptural facts just told us so. The New Testament revealed this to us. Out of the heavens He let you hear His voice to discipline you, and on earth He let you see His great fire. And you heard his words from the midst of the fire. Peter revealed to us that this was God the Father. Because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power, driving out from before, before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in and to give you their land for an inheritance as it is today. Know therefore today, and take it to your heart, that he, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. The scriptural facts tell us, beyond dispute, that Moses is talking about God the Father. Peter told us that it was God the Father that Moses is talking about at Deuteronomy 18. Jesus tells us it was God the Father. I will put my words in his mouth. Jesus tells us over and over. The words I speak are the Father's, not my own. God the Father is the God spoken about at Deuteronomy 18. The God who spoke out of the fire. There is no other besides Him. He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other God the Father. The scripture proves it. Peter tells us it was the Father who made the promise at Deuteronomy 18 to raise up the prophet, and that prophet turns out to be Jesus, his servant son, whom the Father sent. At Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 18, we learn that the Father who made this promise is the one who spoke out of the fire on the mountain to the people of Israel. It's what it says. And because the people were terrified to directly hear his voice as they did in the giving of the law, the Father promised to raise up a prophet so they would not near need to hear his voice again. Whose voice? The Father's. I will put my words in his mouth, just what Jesus said, when we get to the New Testament. My words are not my own, they're the Father's. And since the Scriptures tell us unambiguously it was the Father who spoke out of the fire, we know that Moses here is referring to the Father when he speaks these words. There is no other besides Him. He is God, and there is nobody else God the Father. There is no God besides God the Father. For us, there is one God. And for us, there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. No one is God but the Father who spoke out of the fire on the mountain and promised to raise up a prophet so that they would not need to hear his voice. And that prophet, Peter tells us, and Jesus as well, 
was the Son of the Father, Jesus, whom the Father sent and put his words in Jesus' mouth. And that is why this conversation happened. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, What command is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do you think they might be talking about Jesus Christ's God there? These two Israelites, do you think he, they might be talking about their God? Jesus Christ's God? And this other Israelite's God? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one. And what does that mean? There is no other besides him. Deuteronomy 4, 35 and 39. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. The scribe had it right, and Jesus agreed. How did Jesus obey that foremost command? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. How did he obey it? How did he go about it? How did he in interpret it to obey it? He referred to the Father, his God, the God of Israel. That's who he interpreted the command to be about, and that's how he obeyed it. His Father alone was his God, and he loved his Father alone with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind and all his strength. He did not interpret this to refer to a triune God. There is no other but the Father alone. The Father alone is God. There is one God, Jesus Christ's God. The Israelite Jesus had a God. Who was it? The Father alone. Jesus Christ God was no trinity. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. When Jesus read those words, who do you think he thought it was about? This isn't difficult. It was about his God. All you really need to know is that the God of Israel is Jesus Christ God. You don't even need to look for anything else. And his God was no trinity, but the Father alone. That's all you need to know. That there is one God, and that God is necessarily Jesus Christ's God. It's that simple. It's inescapable. There is no other besides Him. He is God. There is nobody else. And as we've seen, the New Testament doesn't reveal a triune God was the God of Israel, but the Father of Jesus was the God of Israel. And nobody but the Father. The one who spoke out of the fire. There is no other besides him. The New Testament is showing us that the one who spoke out of the fire is the same one who raised up the prophet Jesus, God the Father. Jesus Christ, God. Where Matthew says, Out of Egypt I called my son. Who would that be saying this? God the Father. 
Jesus is not the Son of the Triune God. He's the Son of God the Father. Just like true believers are the Son of God the Father. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Same identical father. The father of Israel, the father of Jesus, are the same identical father. And as Jesus said to his disciples, one is your father. God the Father brought Israel out of Egypt and spoke to Israel out of the fire on the mountain. The same identical Father. Deuteronomy 32 Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your Father who has bought you? We just saw that. He bought them out of Egypt. The Father. God the Father. Who is the identical Father as the Father of Israel. You neglected the rock who begat you and forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord spurned them because of, their provoca of the provocation of his sons and daughters. Verse 20, I believe, Then he, Yahweh, speaks, and he says a bunch of stuff, and in verse 39 he says, I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. God the Father says this. And we are told by the facts of Scripture. It is God the Father who says, I am He, and there is no other God besides me. There's nobody else. Do you believe God? Or do you deny Him and resort to the lie of a man-made three-person image? idolatry what do you do are you that warped that you refuse to believe God the Father are you there is one God no God but God the Father no God but Jesus Christ's God it's that simple if there's one God that God has to be Jesus Christ God, not your man-made image, your three-person God, which is nothing more than a doctrine devised by men in paper and ink. It's twisted. Idolatry. Idolatry is not a good thing. The Bible proves beyond any doubt this is the Father speaking in the giving of the law. And the same Bible tells us He is God and there is no other but Him, the Father. Trinitarians have for themselves an idol, committing the heinous sin of idolatry. They have crafted their own God, adultery against God, and earning for themselves the wrath of a jealous God, the only God, Jesus Christ's, God. They have a man-made God. That's why you can't find this God mentioned anywhere in the Scriptures doing anything or saying anything. So you have to resort as a Trinitarian to the sick practice of imagining your man-made God into the text and pretending that wherever you want, you can just imagine the passage is talking about a triune God. If you're doing that, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. The scriptural facts tell us Moses is referring to God the Father. No other besides Him. It's Him. He is God. 
And there is nobody else. The facts are all there. But because it's a big confirmation bias routine, Trinitarians don't bother with the scriptural facts because their God is a God of their own imaginations, an image designed by men, an idol fabricated by men from their own imaginations. Since they imagined up their own God, they imagine their imagined God into the scriptures wherever they think they might be able to get away with it. And you can hear James White admitting to that fact in a video in response to Anthony Buzzard. I also have a video about that. James White is basically admitting that he's going to declare, wherever he can get away with it, that the God being spoken of in any given Old Testament passage is the triune God. Wherever he can get away with it, he's just going to say that's what it is. Pretty sick. Pretty sick. So instead of looking for scriptural facts to see if those facts specifically identify God in key passages like this, like Deuteronomy 4, 35 and 39, they just go right ahead and imagine whatever they like. It's pathetic, really. There's one thing they'll never escape. The only God is the God of Jesus. Jesus Christ, God. And we should serve no God but our Lord's God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Idolatry is a heinous sin. You'll, you'll find in the Bible that idolatry, you know, it, it'll talk about idols like they're deaf and dumb. And they make you deaf and dumb. Well, think about how it's made Trinitarians. They're blind. They're deaf. They're dumb because of their idol. They see only what they want to see. If they want to see that their man-made God, their idol, is real, if that's what they want to see, that's what they're going to see. It's a very sick behavior. And this is what happens when you step into idolatry. And it, it is a terrible thing. What did we read at Exodus 20? We have a jealous God. You don't commit adultery against a jealous God. Or you will incur the wrath of God. That's what it means. And you are blaspheming the name of God because God is Jesus Christ God, the Father alone. And by worshipping this man-made three-person idol, you are blaspheming the name of God who is the Father alone. You are blaspheming Jesus Christ's God, our Lord's God, blaspheming Him. You're mocking Him by worshipping this man-made idol. This God that men came up with through their own reasoning process their own rationalizations in their confirmation bias routine, their sick behavior, and out comes their golden calf. We just put all these facts in the oven, and out came this three-person God. Yeah, right. Right. The same kind of thing Aaron did when Moses was up on the mountain. Sick. Idolatry, blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ's God, our God, our God, and Jesus Christ's God. Let us not blaspheme the name of our God. 
by bowing down before man-made idols, whether they're paper and ink, whether an image is in paper and ink, like the Trinity shield. Let us make no image of God. God is spirit. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only God. May God bless you. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with your Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Joshua Rogers is a writer and Christian columnist. While a poor young law student, he was given a $50 ticket for driving with an expired license. The police officer told him that if he obtained a new license within two days, he wouldn't have to pay the ticket. $50 was way more than Joshua could afford, so he went to the Department of Motor Vehicles to renew his driver's license. After waiting an hour and a half to be seen, he made it to the counter, had his picture taken, and filled out the paperwork. That'll be $22, the clerk told him. 22, Joshua exclaimed. I thought it was only 17. It was, the clerk said. Now it's 22. The problem was, Joshua didn't have $22. He was $5 short. The clerk agreed to hold his application while he ran out to his car to look for some loose change. Digging under the seats and in the glove compartment, Joshua was able to come up with a dollar twenty-four. Still, three dollars and seventy-six cents short. Joshua felt desperate. If he didn't have three dollars and seventy-six cents, he certainly didn't have fifty dollars to pay for the ticket if he couldn't get his license renewed. In desperation, he prayed to Yahweh. Father, he said, could you please give me four dollars? Like, could you just make it appear somewhere? Getting out of his car, he looked around on the ground, hoping to find some change. Nothing. He would have to go back in and tell the clerk that he wasn't going to be able to pay for his license. Just then, a brown-haired woman in a blue truck drove up and parked. The woman got out and immediately walked over to Joshua. Looking right in his eyes, she asked, Do you need something? Joshua was shocked. Stammering a little, he said, Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I do. If you don't mind, I mean... I actually need four, four dollars. He tried to explain the situation, but before he had even finished, the woman had taken the money out of her wallet and was pressing it into his hand. In thinking back to that day, Joshua says, quote, To this day, I marvel that the lady so boldly approached me in the parking lot. Though she didn't directly hear my prayer, Yah must have somehow shared the request with her, and thankfully she was listening closely enough to hear his concern for my relatively minor need. If she were like a lot of us, she might have ignored that prompting from Yah. It wouldn't have been big enough. We want to change the world, to prove how big our God is, how big His plans are. But even a small task is big if it's His will. I prayed for four dollars, and Yahweh used a seemingly random lady to provide— but through her obedience, he provided more than pocket change. He showed me how much he loves me, that he cares about the details of my life, and that he sends people along to meet even my most basic needs. Unquote. Second Samuel chapter 22 verse 7 tells us, In my distress I called upon Yahweh and cried out to my Eloah. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. 
the freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open eager to receive all who come to Him. If you're enjoying WLC Radio, Invite your friends to listen in too. If you know someone interested in last day events or you have a Bible study partner, tell them about our website, worldslastchance.com. You have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31-meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm -hmm.